episode 53 of Let's Talk Bitcoin, a twice weekly show about the ideas, people, and projects building the digital economy and the future of money. Visit us at letstalkbitcoin.com for our daily guest blog, all our past episodes, and of course, tipping addresses. My name is Adam B. Levine, and today's show is about how things change over time. Libertarians and Bitcoin seem like a peanut butter and jelly situation, natural allies at a core level. Yet many prominent minds have been silent or scornful of the upstart currency. Daniel Krawis joins me for a wide-ranging interview that spans from the origins of money to dishonest altcoins. Later, when software can have its own bank account, we'll see an ecosystem of independent, virus-like service providers looking to fill holes in the market and pay for their hosting. We get evolutionary and talk survival of the solvent. But first, Dwala and Bitcoin grew up alongside each other, but if the latest announcement out of the private Dwala system is any indication, the honeymoon's over, and compliance costs are to blame. Thanks to everyone who tips, comments, emails, and listens. Enjoy the show. You guys may be familiar with Dwala. Uh, they came out uh, maybe a little over a year ago, basically stated that their mission was kind of to undermine uh, credit card processing. They're a payment processor that offers a 25 cent transaction fee. And actually, I think under $10, it's there's no transaction fee on money transfers online. And, uh, you know, this sounds pretty good, I guess, maybe to people who like Bitcoin and want to be able to do frictionless transactions over the Internet. But unfortunately, Dwala has been, well, hostile to Bitcoin. They were uh, kind of making news because they may have been sort of trolling local Bitcoins and going after people who were using Dwala accounts to trade Bitcoin peer to peer with other people and uh, shutting their accounts down. Recently, they've put out an announcement saying that they are cutting all ties with Bitcoin related exchanges. So they don't want anything to do with Bitcoin. If a user trades Bitcoin using Dwala, if a merchant accepts payments with Bitcoin and somehow that's tied into Dwala, if somebody wants to send fiat money to a Bitcoin exchange using Dwala, they're going to be having no part of it. And basically, it sounds like they're scared because they don't believe that they can be in compliance with those magical regulations that uh, keep changing and are so vague. Um, Listen, the only fake money we take here is green paper fake money. <laughs> Let's get that very, very clear. I'll read you an Dwala's email that they sent to uh, their users. This kind of shows, I think, what's going on in, in the minds of the Dwala people. Dear user, as you know, Dwala does not sell, accept, mine, value, take possession of, or hold Bitcoin or any other virtual currency product. And none of Dwala's users transact business with Dwala using Bitcoin or any other virtual currency product. However, recent interest involving vir virtual currency and its exchanges has created uncertainty and confusion around virtual currency and Dwala's relationship with a small number of its exchanges, and this has forced Dwala to reassign resources, funds, and services. As Dwala gears up for a new stage of growth, we recognize we can no longer sustain this merchant base, which is only 0.1% of Dwala's merchants and its unique needs, and that attempting to do so jeopardizes both of our community's starkly different but similarly ambitious vision. Starting October 28th at 4 p.m. Central Time. So they are divorcing anything that has to do with Bitcoin or any virtual currency. That first sentence, man, that was pretty striking to me. Dwala does not have anything to do with Bitcoin. We don't sell. We don't accept. We don't value. We don't take possession of. We don't hold any kind of virtual currency. So who do you think they were talking to there, Stephanie? Who are they talking to? I don't if know. They're, saying, they're regulators. We don't hold virtual. Yeah, exactly. Okay, they're the not regulators. talking to the users. They're, 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 that first sentence is a message intended for a very specific audience. Yeah, it's legal. Look, Ma, I got nothing in my hands. You have to imagine that they're a little bit nervous after what happened to Liberty Reserve. I mean, Dwala, Dwala and Liberty Reserve both have that commonality of being a private currency issuer who pegs their currency to the U.S. dollar. Ultimately, it's a private currency, but because it's got that peg, it's like a digital version of dollars that it's a little bit more efficient because it goes outside of the existing banking system. In the context of the regulation for Liberty Reserve, that meant that they were, you know, money launderers. And that meant that they were they were the largest money laundering syndicate. I mean, like there were there was all this rhetoric that surrounded the closure of that establishment. One has to imagine that Dwala's got to be looking at that and going, are we next? Could that be uh, us? Are we talking about the HSBC again? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think Dwala thinks they're not yet too big to jail. Exactly. This is definitely a legalese statement. 
it's too bad. You know, I read this and I feel a little bit uh, afraid, you know. <laughs> the pattern's clear, right? Regulators and those governments that really don't like Bitcoin or don't want it to succeed can only really regulate the fiat aspects of Bitcoin, the on-ramps and off-ramps into the Bitcoin ecosystem. Or, or to use another analogy, our inclination so far has been, we'll build an economy up there in the sky <laughs> and you can have your airports. Screw it, get the refuelers, we'll just not land. Which isn't very easy, you know, because there's all these people on the ground saying, that looks like fun, I'd like to join you, but I can't find any airports nearby. This is the bottom line. The only part of Bitcoin that can be controlled is the conversion into and out of fiat, and that's, of course, the only part that will be controlled. All that means is that the importance of uh, peer-to-peer trading like global Bitcoins is going to be paramount. It's harder to do local Bitcoins, especially online, though, if you can't use things like Dwala, right? Yep. You got to resort to cash or different methods. And one by one, I think they're going to kind of crack down upon. But notice what this is doing, right? It's putting into question the fungibility and liquidity of the fiat reserves of all of these services. And just like what happened when Mt. Gox started having withdrawal problems, if all of the exits are barred and the only one that's open is the one that says Bitcoin above the door, you run for that exit. And and this is what has happened again and again. Each time the regulators attack the fiat exits, that drives people to buy Bitcoin in order to exit a market and drives the price up. All of this flailing around is really putting to question the full faith that you would have in the financial instrument of fiat. It's basically highlighting how crappy fiat is, how easily it is controlled by financial interests, how easily it is controlled by cravenly co-opted regulators, why it's so important to escape these controls. Basically, they're doing our marketing for us. Do you think it goes a little deeper than Dwala being really afraid of these regulators, though? Do you think that Dwala actually doesn't like Bitcoin because they say, hey, we were kind of trying to do that. We're trying to offer, you know, a payment processing service that undermines credit cards and offers frictionless transactions online. And Bitcoin basically does it better than us. So, you know, we have to find some way to compete with them or take it down. I don't think so at all. If I'm Dwala and I'm looking at this, look, I've, I've just built an on-ramp and, and this is the Bitcoin is a really nice freeway to feed into. So from my perspective, if I was Dwala, I'd see Bitcoin as a tremendous opportunity for growth, profit, as well as diversification over traditional currencies. You know, you don't want to put too many eggs in the dollar basket because Bernanke's twirling it above his head. So you, you really need to think about how this is affecting the fiat currency reputation. But I really don't think Dwala is doing this because of self-interest or businessmen. It certainly doesn't sound like it if you read the first couple of lines in the email. What that email tells you is, we're scared of being sued, so we're going to throw out the bathwater and the baby together. I don't know if it's that simple necessarily, Andreas. I think that there really is genuinely very little in it for Dwala, because just like with the banks, it's a it's a one way valve, right? Once the money goes through and into Bitcoin, then most of it is pretty much going to stay there because it's only useful as an on ramp, right? Once you get I disagree. Past, you, you disagree. So you think that that it would be a viable back and forth going between these services? I mean, I, I don't think it's about the 25 cent fee. This is my point. When did you first hear with Dwala? Yes, when it became right. relevant to Bitcoin. Yes. And, yeah. and the, the point is that every single person I've ever heard speaking about Dwala is speaking about Dwala in the context of Bitcoin. Now, obviously, I have a selection bias in there because I talk right. to Bitcoin people. However, it's clear to me that Dwala gained a ton of attention, marketing, and if you like, the Streisand effect um, by being associated with uh, Bitcoin. And, and that's a good thing. Uh, for Dwala. So so I, I can't see a scenario because a lot of the people I see leaving Dwala right now are saying, yeah, sure. The only reason we signed up with you is for the virtual currency. So you're dropping them. We're dropping you. OK, but at what cost really becomes the question, because in that note, they say that only 0.1 percent of their users actually utilize it for Bitcoin, which is legitimately by any standard a very small percentage. And yet they have to maintain a separate staff that is able to deal with the compliance issues that go along with it. So I, mean, I wonder if, how much of their marketing comes from that, though. I mean, it might be a tiny percent of their users, but how much of their 
public brand awareness comes directly from articles referencing Bitcoin. Sure. But let's just to, to simplify this conversation, I think it's important to try and look at it from their perspective. And from their perspective, regardless of if they're getting a bunch of earned press as a result of this, their perception is that this is a very small portion of their business and ultimately doesn't generate much income for them and ultimately has meaningful costs associated with it. Now, that might be a short term perspective to take, but it looks like it's the one that they are taking. They're saying we have less to gain from this than we do to lose from this if we wind up being treated like other virtual currency providers who have gone through this identity problem. Because again, that's the issue they have is that they have a quasi anonymous currency too that lets you without getting the identity of the person you're sending the money to, send money to them. That of course is a problem. You look at it on that side and you've got companies like Liberty Reserve and Dwala and, you know, other private currencies, and they have almost nothing to gain from interfacing with Bitcoin in much the same way that the existing banking system doesn't have much to gain. From the other side, an Amazon or some other very low margin merchant has everything to gain, but they can't because there's still this equation in play where they don't understand what the risk is to possibly exposing it, even though there are tangible, almost immediate value to be gained from it just through the lower fees. Making a rational assessment of the risk benefits of Bitcoin within their business, and that rational assessment leads them to drop Bitcoin. Absolutely. Right. Now, the, the real argument is, is that because there's not enough benefit, or is it because there's too much risk? Of course, it's both. But really what I think is happening here is that the risk has been artificially inflated by deliberate attacks on Bitcoin holding companies. And by inflating that risk, it tips the risk benefit equation to a point where people start dropping it. This is not about a lack of benefit or difficulty in Bitcoin. It's all about artificially created risk, counterparty risk, legal risk that's created by regulators. So is Dwala just the tip of the iceberg? You know, are we going to see all kinds of companies, payment processors, et cetera, within the legacy banking system, just giving the cold shoulder to anything that could possibly be related to Bitcoin? How would we know it's different from what we have now? I mean, I think that's exactly what we're seeing across the board. There have been lots of startups that have attempted to deal with this problem of buying Bitcoin one way or the other, buying, selling Bitcoin, however you want to go about it. It really just is a genuinely hard problem because, again, it's an almost impossible situation that we find ourselves in. Yeah. And you're going to basically recycle these companies every six months. They're going to fail and someone else is going to come in and try to solve the same problem, fail, et cetera, et cetera. Now, at the end of the day, there's going to be a pile of failed companies at the feet of Bitcoin because of the actions of the regulators and their attempts to slay the dragon. But we don't care. Hey, we're consumers. That means we get valuable service, even though it's a bit interruptible. If I get my Bitcoin from one company or another, as long as there's someone out there who will keep selling me Bitcoin. So, you know, okay, pile of dead companies. That's the price we have to pay. And ultimately, this conversation has been really focused on the United States, too. The United States has the ability to impact how the United States plays in this market, but it doesn't really have the ability to impact many other markets besides a more advisory role. And I mean, again, the the genie's out of the bottle on this one. So it's more of a question of damage control than it is really trying to to shape where we're going on this. We're, we're, we're on this journey one way or the other. It's just a question of, you know, how fast we're going and what the exact directions are we're using to get there. There's going to be a very important tipping point for each, to, I think. And, and that tipping point is where the pain of trying to stop Bitcoin and the obvious futility of that effort becomes much greater than the value that the US government or the US state is getting out of of Bitcoin. And hopefully that's a moment of epiphany where other countries are pulling ahead in their Bitcoin endeavors and their Bitcoin investments and innovations. And the US is left behind, not just losing opportunity, but also fighting a battle that is completely wasteful, futile, and in the end will fail. You know, I've said this a couple of times before, but I think it's worth repeating here. My feeling about what's going on in the U.S. right now is that we are building and proving these models. But ultimately, the people who are going to utilize these models are not in the U.S. Yeah. You know, it, it's, we, we are we are doing the we have the luxury of being able to throw effort at this while it doesn't really matter to us from a functional standpoint. We're figuring out what works. All of these results, once we've generated them in this lab here, go out to the rest of the world and they get to just pick the ones that work. I think that's really that's the good outcome and the good thing that we can do in the U.S. at this point.
You're listening to Let's Talk Bitcoin, the premier audio cast providing news and insights that cover the rapidly evolving world of digital money. Our twice weekly shows include analysis of late breaking news, updates on key technical, business and regulatory issues and in-depth interviews with the key people driving the new digital economy. Let's Talk Bitcoin offers sponsors an attractive way to reach a targeted and savvy audience. For more information, email sponsors at letstalkbitcoin.com. More than 300,000 users and counting trust blockchain.info. It's a Bitcoin wallet service and a wealth of Bitcoin information and is completely free to use. With a blockchain.info wallet, you'll get the convenience of a web wallet and the security of a desktop client. Blockchain.info is also a block explorer. You can use it to see Bitcoin transactions in real time, check the balance of any Bitcoin address, and view many handy Bitcoin charts all for free. See what they have to offer today at blockchain.info. Daniel Krawis is a master's student at UT Austin studying software engineering and is writing his first book, Crypto Anarchy, Freedom in the Computer Age. Daniel, thanks for joining me today. How are you? Uh, very good. How are you? I am doing well. So we're sitting here. It is uh, October 22nd, about 10.02 a.m. The markets are totally exploding. I've been watching over the last couple of hours the, the price go up about 20 bucks. Uh, do you think that we're in another bubble or do you have any idea of what's going on with markets right now? Well, let's, let's not call it a bubble. Let's call it hyper monetization because that's really what's happening. Uh, Bitcoins are taking over the world, maybe not tomorrow, but as more people join in into the big Bitcoin family, it just makes Bitcoin more enticing for other people. But I mean, I expect we'll see some extreme volatility pretty soon. But, you know, if you just think back to April, really all that happened was not a bubble. The price went way up and then it corrected. But in the end, it, it stabled around a point that was significantly higher than where it began. So, so there have been people that, who have been since kind of the beginning of this saying that Silk Road and a lot of these, I don't know if the word is illicit, but less legitimate, you know, less tax paying businesses sort of use actually casts a negative light on Bitcoin as a whole. And so simultaneously, as we saw what's been going on with, with uh, Silk Road, we, we had the price go down and then the price go back up. So, I mean, what, what's happening here? Yeah, well, first of all, as to illicit businesses, you know, I think that we shouldn't try to make Bitcoin appear more acceptable to the mainstream because Bitcoin is so great. It sells itself. They're going to be wanting Bitcoin very soon anyway, even if they think it has a bad impression today. The amazing thing that happened with the markets is that, you know, the news came out that the Silk Road had been taken down. The price crashed for like two hours and then it was almost right back to where it was. And it took about a week for it to go right back to the same level. What that shows is that the people who were buying Bitcoins then had a much more long-term vision for Bitcoin than as simply something to buy drugs with online over the Silk Road. They knew that there would be more versions, better versions of the Silk Road that are coming out. And they also knew that all sorts of other things are possible with Bitcoins. And the destruction of this one company has really no, no long-term meaning for Bitcoin. Although we really need to honor the Silk Road as an amazing achievement that, and, and Bitcoin couldn't be where it is today without it. But however, now Bitcoin is so strong that we don't need it. So early on, it acted as a bootstrapping mechanism because it gave us, it's not us, but generally speaking, it gave, uh, you know, something that you could do with Bitcoin that you couldn't necessarily do with anything else. But yeah. right now we've, we've passed the point. It served its purpose. It's, it's catalyzed whatever it needed to catalyze. And now we've moved past that. So it doesn't matter anymore. Right. Right. Um, and, and now we're actually starting to see some legal businesses that, use use bitcoins in ways that let them do all kinds of things that that you can't do with credit cards so it's not it's not just you know add bitcoins as a payment option we're getting new businesses that that can only do what they do because of bitcoins there was this cointagen ebook store that i learned about from 
from your podcast. That's one of the things I saw. And then there's this new site. I don't remember what it's called, but it, it lets you do video game gambling, which is fantastic. Yeah, there's one called LeakCoin that's doing that, and I think there are two or three other projects that are that are going in that same way. You know, I mean, that that is a really interesting point. There are a lot of these problems that have just been problems for the longest time, and now through Bitcoin, it seems like people are finding ways to solve them. Yeah. So, Daniel, people come to Bitcoin for different reasons and kind of through varied means. How did you find yourself learning about and then writing and speaking about cryptocurrency? Since about 2005, I've been an, an anarchist, Rothbardian, anarcho-capitalist. That means that I was a gold bug and I wanted all the money to be replaced by gold-based currency. So I first learned about Bitcoin in 2010 and um, there was no mountain gox and uh, not much of anything. It did, it did have a price at, at that point. The pizza sale had happened. I remember on this, this website that I read about it, there were there was around six things that were listed that you could buy with it. And I was like, what is this? This is like, this is ridiculous. But then it was around the beginning of the 2011 mania that really convinced me that, that there was something to Bitcoin because I could see that it was behaving a regular commodity and it had all sorts of properties that gold bugs should like if they thought about it a little bit. That's when I first took the plunge and I got a little bit and I'm very happy with that. But I wish I had got into mining around 2011. That's what the really smart people were doing. Uh, But now I'm trying to get involved with, with Bitcoin businesses. That's what the smart people are doing today, I think. We just returned from the cryptocurrency conference in Atlanta, and uh, was that your first Bitcoin event? Yes. So, what was your impression of it? I mean, it was a it was a more libertarian flavored event than some of the other ones we've attended for Let's Talk Bitcoin. But I think that uh, it was a really interesting crowd. I really loved how it was organized. There, you had all kinds of different people with different perspectives. So, there really needs to be a better merging between the libertarian groups and the technological computer science cryptography groups because they're really very natural allies. And actually, I just went to the Students for Liberty conference in Dallas last weekend and they didn't have a single, none of the speakers mentioned Bitcoins. It was on everybody's mind. They, they, did, they, didn't, they didn't know enough about it though. So I was there. I, I mean, it was weird because this was sort of the first time I've been anywhere where everybody wasn't already talking about Bitcoins constantly uh, for a long time. So that, that helped remind me that there's still a lot of people who need to uh, understand what's going on. So earlier in our conversation, you said that you believe in anarcho-capitalist principles. You know, compared to libertarianism, can you explain to me what some of those differences are? Okay, well, I, I would say that libertarians are basically anarcho-capitalists who haven't thought things through to their logical conclusion. Libertarians believe in private property and are against the initiation of coercion against other people and their property. Now, I should say that doesn't mean that you can't have socialist communities or worker cooperatives. The important thing really is just that property is originally owned by individuals and groups and organizations are created by their voluntary decisions. So anarcho-capitalists simply take this idea and apply it to all, all industries. Many libertarians will say that police and and courts and national defense are legitimate functions of the state, whereas the anarcho-capitalists would say that none of these are and they can all be produced privately via a for-profit business model or some kind of charity model or uh, some sort of cooperative model. Uh, There are all kinds of options available, but the point is that they need to be provided privately with organizations created by voluntary association, not through the state. 
in anarcho-capitalism compared to libertarianism, at least in these general terms we're talking about here, you could say that uh, libertarians believe in a minimal government that is a government as we know it today, providing basic services, whereas anarcho-capitalists do not believe in uh, any sort of government that's not local. Well, anarcho-capitalists would still call themselves libertarians. The people who believe in minimal government are called minarchists, and the people who believe in no government are called anarchists. Uh, And together, libertarian encompasses both groups. So now, the imagery that often comes up when talking about anarchism or uh, people who identify as anarchists is that of the the bomb-throwing anarchist. And it seems like that's a that's like an offensive stereotype. But really, besides that, it doesn't seem to to play much with any of the characters that we come into contact with identifying by that. How do you think that happened? Well, my understanding is that in the early 20th century, some of the anarchist groups did decide that violence might be an effective strategy for promoting their goals. And that has since then, that has produced this, this stereotype has been a bad mark on the anarchist movement ever since. In general, I would say that anarchists are very peaceful people and they don't believe that violence is going to be effective in promoting a free, peaceful, stateless society. Of course, I I promote Bitcoin as a great means of promoting anarchy. I don't think it's going to be enough on its own, but it it can take great, great strides towards reducing the power of the state. And of course, Bitcoin is completely peaceful. What we can see with, with the Silk Road that there was none of the violence that you normally think about when you imagine the drug industry, except of course when the police actually got involved and started investigating Ross Ulrich. So you're writing a book called Crypto Anarchy, Freedom in the Computer Age, and you also started a club called the Crypto Anarchy Club at UT Austin where you attend. You know, you mentioned that you promote Bitcoin as a means of promoting anarchy or decentralization. How do those two things fit together and how is Bitcoin a tool or cryptocurrency a tool that's relevant to this movement? Nassim Taleb, the philosopher and investor, has a concept called uh, anti-fragility. Uh, that's something that gets stronger when you try to attack it. It, it rearranges itself into something that's less vulnerable every time you try to hurt it. That's, that's what Bitcoin is. It's a network of people who are all very enthused about it and who want to make it work and where, where each of them has the ability to make small contributions that all add on top of each other. Bitcoin is so useful that it's like a, a universal acid it sort of absorbs everything that you you can throw at it. It makes it quite easy for people to resist the government and to create organizations that are similar to everyday businesses, but which are also able to evade government oversight. And of course, the Silk Road is a great example. Now there are lots of other competitors and people are even talking about even better versions of the Silk Road that don't have a central point of failure. This idea of the online anonymous drug bazaar is here to stay and it's an enormous advance uh, above what we had previously. So, so that's an example of how Bitcoin allows people to evade the government, but, but ultimately it's Bitcoin is like super cash. It's like cash, but a lot better in many ways. And of course, as long as you can avoid going through the the banking cartel, that alone gives you a huge edge in how easily you can resist the government's orders. 
the anti-fragile concept is a really interesting one. And as we've been watching what's been going on with the Silk Road and then watching the price as it relates to that, I mean, like I said at the beginning of this interview, the price had just peaked I th about uh, $200, which is a point we hadn't been at, I think, in the last four or five months. It really has made me wonder if maybe we've passed that, that tipping point in the anti-fragile cycle. Because, I mean, the whole concept behind anti-fragile is like you punch something and if it isn't destroyed entirely, then it is more resistant to future impacts that are the same because it know it, you know it learns from from those impacts so are we now at the point in the cycle where it there has almost no negative impact whatsoever and in fact doing something that should cause a detrimental effect actually just causes a positive effect well i mean i think that bitcoin was always anti-fragile but right now what we're seeing is that the, the people who who own bitcoins now understand that and, and that's what we've seen for the past few months is um, they've been buying into any weakness and if anything bad happens it doesn't matter um, because they know that at the long term Bitcoin can overcome people are so much less nervous now than they were earlier this year even but I think that they were wrong to be nervous earlier this year you know lots of people were saying oh the government is going to shut Bitcoin down and uh, that really wasn't a, a realistic fear at, at any point. Now, if the government really tried to shut Bitcoin down, they might be able to do it, but they don't seem to understand what the threat is. And very, very quickly, it, it, it's going to become more and more difficult for them. In Austrian economics, there are these conjectural histories about the origin of money. What this means is you try to think about the most general possible story about how money came into existence. Uh, in other words, you're trying to think of some sequence that should apply to every possible instance of the creation of money. That includes all the varieties of, of human behavior. What's the lowest common denominator for the story of money? There are two basic issues. The idea of how a medium of exchange becomes money, and then there's the idea of how a good which is not a medium of, of exchange becomes a medium of exchange. And both of these are independent. So once you have a medium of exchange, it really doesn't matter how it got to that point for how it's going to become money. So the way this happens is there are maybe several media of exchanges, none of which is, well, first of all, I should give the, a definition of money. Usually money is defined as a medium of exchange which is the most marketable, the most accepted on the market. There are several other definitions, but they all are, are roughly this. It's the biggest medium of exchange, the one that uh, almost everybody is using. So the network effect so, has a big role in making money money. That is the answer. Just think about if, if you have two media of exchanges which are both equally marketable. In other words, everybody is indifferent as to whether you pay in medium A or medium B, say gold and silver. They both like either one. If either one even gets a tiny edge over the other, that actually makes it superior as a medium of exchange because a more marketable media medium of exchange is is better because there's more you can buy with it. A tiny edge of one medium of exchange over another should be expected to produce a positive feedback and eventually the medium with the slight edge should grow to have an enormous edge and ultimately one should emerge 
as money. So when we're talking about small advantages and causing one particular one to emerge as money versus not, this is because the the fact that they are exchangeable is what makes them valuable. Once they've once they've so there there's like there's a threshold where it has to be a medium of exchange in order to be considered for this. But once it is a medium of exchange, how it got there is irrelevant. But so long as it's in that category, how useful it is, is determined by how many people are using it in much the same way that a language is determined by how people, how many people are using it. That's a very, very good analogy. And we can see that with languages in the world, that languages which are widely used become more widely used. They become trade languages, the common tongue for for lots of different people. But the reason this story is important is initially a lot of Austrians didn't like Bitcoin. They're actually coming around now, but they didn't like Bitcoin because it's, it's kind of weird for them. They're used to thinking about gold. But what they could have observed is that Bitcoin is already a medium of exchange, so it could become money, and there's really no reason that it shouldn't. The earlier story about how a, a good becomes a medium of exchange, the good must have demand. In other words, it must have a price before it's a medium of exchange. That's the essential principle. There must be some reason that people want it before they're using it to to buy things. Uh, So with gold, that's pretty obvious. Gold is good for jewelry. And, you know, if they had electronics thousands of years ago, it could have been good for that too. But people like gold for reasons other than as money. But the confusing thing about Bitcoin is that it appears to be good only as a medium of exchange and not actually good for anything else. That's the fallacy. That's how it, how it looks. You have to think deeper to see the answer. And really the answer is just that even if it is not used as a medium of exchange, it has investment value to people who think, well, one day maybe it will be a medium of exchange. And if it is, oh boy, I'm going to be rich. And that's just what we see in history, is that originally Bitcoins had no price at all. People were just mining them and playing around with them like toys. Uh, But then some people started to seriously think about if Bitcoins became money, the very first exchanges of, of Bitcoins for dollars were to people who just wanted to have some, just in case, just based on that remote seeming possibility. I mean, if you can get 10,000 Bitcoins for a dollar, I something like that, why not, you know? And then once there, that tiny, tiny base of demand that could be built upon step by step. Eventually, people started seeing Bitcoin businesses. Each step in the process builds upon the previous. So once there are more businesses, then it seems more likely that that Bitcoin is going to become money in the future. So then there's more investment demand. And once there's more investment demand, then Bitcoin can actually be used for more trade. In, in other words, you, you get the picture. Right. It becomes a self-reinforcing cycle after a reasonably short period of time. You mentioned that where all money is equal. So you, so in your earlier example, you said uh, silver and gold. I'm wondering, though, isn't Bitcoin's value derived more from the fact that it's actually easier to use as money than something like like, like silver or gold because it doesn't have that liability of physicality? I would say ultimately the demand for Bitcoin is still more investment demand than demand to use it as money right now. The reason there's investment demand is people who examine it can see that it is better than gold in a lot of ways. Bitcoins actually take the advantages of dollars and gold and sort of combine them and have none of the defects. 
Uh, gold has the problem that it's physical and requires a big banking infrastructure to use as money. And of course, you need money substitutes for everyday transactions. And that leads to the problem of fractional reserve banking. You don't have that with bitcoins. Whereas the advantage of dollars is that they can be transferred around the world because dollars are no longer physical. Of course, bitcoins are much better at that. You still have to go through a ridiculous banking system to transfer dollars. But dollars do have that advantage over gold. So yes, anyway, the investment demand for Bitcoin derives from the fact that they are superior to gold and dollars as money. But it, ultimately, it's still very speculative at this point, more so than it is people using. Yes. Fair enough. So, Daniel, let, uh, wrapping this up, the first time you and I spoke, it was over BitMessage about an article you wrote on, on altcoins. I think it's totally fine if you want to play around with the code and, you know, tweak some parameters, you know, experiment and incorporate your own ideas. But if you are telling me that your new altcoin is going to be the next big thing and it's going to be equal or, or greater than, than bitcoins, you know, or even a small shadow compared to bitcoins, I think that's disingenuous. And if, if you really believe that, you're, you're lying to yourself. There's really no reason to expect that any altcoin can beat bitcoins in the market just because of the network effect. Now, if you come up with an altcoin that improves upon Bitcoin in some way, Bitcoin can compete by incorporating that improvement into itself. It can also compete just by having so much larger of a user base that any small improvement that, that you might have made in, in your altcoin isn't good enough. If you wanted to create an altcoin that was actually going to beat Bitcoin, you would have to make something that's as great an improvement over Bitcoin as Bitcoin is over the dollar. So you're, you're not going to accomplish this by tweaking some parameters. You'll, you'll have to come up with an idea that's as amazing and innovative as Satoshi's original idea. Uh, so let me just quick suggest the conditions under which you should invest in a, an altcoin. It's possible that an altcoin could survive if it can do things that Bitcoin can't do. In that case, it will serve a very specialized purpose. It will only do that one thing. So if there is an altcoin like that and you think that this altcoin is further away from its potential as Bitcoin is from its potential, then you could get this altcoin. But there really isn't anything like that at all. Now, name coins kind of do something interesting because in addition to being a currency, they are attempting to be a distributed domain name recognition service. And the way name coins work is that you have to use name coins to pay for your distributed domain. At least that is my understanding. If name coins, if the dot bit addresses become popular, then you would expect name coins to play a very tiny specialized role in the Bitcoin economy. So that would possibly be something that might be worthwhile. However, it should still be seen as a disadvantage that this, the dot bit addresses have to use name coins rather than bitcoins. If someone came up with a distributed domain system that was built on top of bitcoins, that would be a better system. And I, I believe that Invictus Innovations is working on something like that. I think the project is called Quixote. So mostly it sounds like you basically need to reinvent the wheel, right? Is that if you're going to have a successful altcoin, you can't just stand on the shoulders of what's come before. You have to actually create something that solves a problem that's not 
that's not fixed by other things. One of the things we've been talking about is the idea that as Bitcoin gets larger, it actually becomes harder to implement new things into it because since so many people have money tied up in it and since the development team is basically volunteers, it, there's a lot of reticence about messing with parts like wallet software, for example. There hasn't been a lot of innovation in Bitcoin wallet software at the core level because there's concern that if something goes wrong, it's going to cost people real money. There are certain improvements that could be made to Bitcoin that will probably never be made because of this, this problem. If there's something that is uh, going to, you know, going to make Bitcoin not work, that'll get fixed. But there are some inefficiencies that may remain that we'll, we'll just have to live with, possibly. So one thing that people sometimes worry about is the centralization of mining, you know, some aspects of the way mining works. That's probably something, I think that's an overblown fear. I, I agree that there are potential problems, but that's probably something that will never improve. Now wallets, there are actually all kinds of different wallets that, that you can make. There hasn't been a lot implemented with that, but, but you can have two-factor wallets, and of course that's only the beginning. You can have wallets that behave in all kinds of interesting ways. Well, one thing I'd like to mention is that we had this big jump in the price of, of Bitcoins over the past, past couple of weeks. This has not been reflected in the Litecoin price. In fact, over the past couple of months, Litecoin has been gradually moving downwards. It did not jump with Bitcoins this week as it did in April. So I, I think that suggests that people are beginning to understand that these altcoins are kind of a sham. And it's really, it's, it's going to be Bitcoin or, or nothing, essentially. Daniel Krawitz, thank you very much for joining us on Let's Talk Bitcoin. Thank you very much. DNS is the Swiss army knife for your domain names, helping meet their customers' individual needs since 1998. EasyDNS has been an outspoken critic of SOPA and CISPA. EasyDNS was an early supporter of Bitcoin, and now they are proud to sponsor this show. Do business with a company that shares your values. Get a 13% discount when you pay with Bitcoin. Go to bitcoin.easydns.com and be sure to use discount code LTB. Hi, Stephanie here. Would you like to turn your book into an enthralling audiobook? Need a persuasive commercial to promote your company? How about a narrator for your explainer video? Here's where I can help. I'm a freelance voiceover artist, and since 2009, I've lent my voice to dozens of audio projects. To hear some examples of my work, check out my website, smvoice.info. If you like what you hear, I'd love to be the voice of your next project. Get in touch at smvoice.info. I've mentioned before one of the very interesting characteristics of Bitcoin is the ability to take something from the legal realm, contracts, and turn it into a technologically solvable equation in the form of a transaction script. So where a traditional escrow transaction really is about a third party signatory in a legal contract, on Bitcoin it's a third party signatory in a digital signature sense. So Bitcoin allows you to take things that are currently only possible through law and make them possible through technology. Well, here's an interesting side effect. Currently, if you want to own and control money, you have to be a person, a natural person or the legal fiction of a person in a bunch of people getting together in a corporation. If you want to control money, you have to be a legal entity. But with Bitcoin, you don't. In fact, money can be controlled programmatically. And what that does, it is actually creates for the first time in history, the possibility of autonomous agents 
that control their own financial resources through direct programmatic control of a wallet. Essentially, AI bots that have a bank account. And up to now, this has been impossible. And now we have the possibility of artificially intelligent agents that can spend money. What that means is really a very interesting scenario where success in the marketplace is judged by the ability of one of these artificial entities to pay its hosting bill and perhaps to grow its hosting bill and spread its survival of the solvent. That's a classic kind of concept in artificial intelligence, right? Is uh, this sort of recapitulating the evolutionary process that biological organisms go through to prove their um, their fitness, their ability to survive and prosper and thrive, right? Yes, I think a- anyone who has taken a even a, a passing first year class in artificial intelligence and and seen genetic algorithms instantly becomes fully convinced of the factual basis of evolution because they can see it in action in front of their eyes. They can see new capabilities emerging out of random processes. So you could really have this, not only genetic algorithms that allow you to have competition between generations as well as swapping of code in the form of DNA fragments equivalent, if you like, but also you could have these agents operating in terms of financial analytics and making investments. They, they could invest in other agents, they could invest in subsidiary agents, and they could deliver dividends to parent agents. It creates all kinds of very interesting scenarios. Let yeah. me play the guy who hasn't taken the artificial intelligence course here. I mean, I, I don't even know if they exist yet. What types of applications do you think that this technology could fit in? A very basic one is a fully autonomous botnet, a botnet that generates Bitcoin perhaps through mining but uses that Bitcoin internally to buy hosting for launching more copies of itself. So a self-aware virus. A self-propagating, self-funding virus. I I think that would be a very interesting thing because we're already seeing botnets and Bitcoin mining converge. It only makes sense that at some point, one of those will escape the control of its parent. And I think that's where you see some interesting effects. The bigger picture here is that while we have been speaking about artificial intelligence in broad terms for the last 25 years and really talked about how it hasn't progressed, in the background, narrow niches of artificial intelligence have made incredible leaps and bounds. So the ability to do speech recognition, speech synthesis, facial recognition, number plate recognition, the ability to implement uh, game theory and genetic algorithms and all of those things. Artificial intelligence has really exploded over the last decade uh, without anyone really knowing Noticing. So once you add money to that equation, it makes things really interesting. So what are we going to do when the robots start demanding to keep their money that they made? There's an incredibly interesting article on Let's Talk Bitcoin.com on the blog by Stan Larimer, where he talks about digital autonomous corporations. And I think one of the interesting things is relating that to Asimov's three laws of robotics. What these do is they set up essentially a a self-regulating morality core that allows an independent autonomous organism to operate in a non-harmful way. Now, we should be embedding things like that, basic controls for propagation and things like that into our own digital autonomous corporations, if you like, or autonomous agents. The problem is some of these will be malicious and they won't be constrained. So you will have sociopath agents, pretty much like corporate capitalism, really. The idea of good or evil as like a definitive truth where there are some things that should not be allowed, as in with the three laws of robotics. The question is, should we be encoding morality into these things? And if that's the case, why aren't we already doing that as far as software is concerned? Well, I think morality looks very different from the perspective of a virus. And these digital autonomous corporations really look much more like viruses than they do more complex species like mammals, primates, or humans. In such terms, morality in a virus is really about propagation speed. (laughs) That's all that matters. As long as you're not killing your host and therefore dying yourself as a result, it's it's really a survival mechanism. There is no, you know, morality is always a survival mechanism in every species. And so I think you can encode safeguards, if you like. They're not really morality codes. They're really technological safeguards to prevent a runaway rogue agent effect. But just like in biological systems, there's going to be a 
huge diversity of strategy artificial intelligences would employ to achieve solvency and thriving and propagation, right? You know, you might even see AIs that do charity or prop up other species or do kind of commensalism where mm -hmm. they kind of aid other AIs in, uh, in their survival and they partner up with them, just like it happens in the biological world. It's not all competition and kill or be killed, eat or be eaten. There's a lot of cooperation too, and that is a viable strategy for survival and uh, prospering. I think it's fascinating to see where this might go. One of the interesting things about genetic algorithms is that they often arrive at solutions that work, but we can't understand why. So the, the thing about these experiential or heuristic-based algorithms is that you can't necessarily understand exactly why it's working correctly or why a certain behavior emerges once you put several of these agents together, the kind of socially emergent behavior you'd see in a hive species like an ant or, or bees. So, so these types of behaviors that emerge, you can't really reverse engineer them and understand what's going on inside, yet they work. So we will see very, very strange things emerge. What stopped artificial intelligence from doing that kind of very rapid evolution, I think, is the lack of resources or the fact that the resources are controlled by an external agent. Once you throw money into that and take away that constraint, really, yeah, you will start seeing potentially some very rapid evolution. I think it'll be interesting to see the development of this as an ecosystem. You're both right. You know, if you look at evolutionary systems, then you do see these solutions pop up in ways that we never would have expected. But it's important to keep in mind that those aren't definitive solutions, right? That's not like, and this is the best way to do it. And no one ever thought of that. It's just that in the particular context of wherever that entity or program is working, that's what happened to work there. But really what we're talking about here is a broader ecosystem that contains millions or, you know, hundreds of millions of different iterations of all of these different things and, and the trends of what's going to work emerging over time. So at the same time, you won't have one solution, but you will have dominant solutions, right? Because those will be the things that consistently are proven to work. Exactly. This is really very similar to watching the ecosystem of altcoins in order to gain understanding of the marketplace context those operate in. Uh, the context is really the environment, and the question is, what is the fitness function that is leading an organism to be successful in this environment? When you look at the strategies that make an organism successful, it tells you a lot more about the environment that organism is in. So for example, let's say we're looking at altcoins, right? We see altcoins like Litecoin and Fredlicoin. What does that tell us about the fitness function and the environment in which these coins are developing? It tells us that one of the issues identified is slow transactions, and that's the fitness function these coins are addressing. If we start seeing strong coin, crypto coin, stealth coin, secret coin, f you government coin, then we know the fitness function has changed. It's now about avoiding government interference. Very similarly with digital autonomous corporations, you can really look at the resulting behavior and use that as a way to understand the environment in which these entities are operating better. Now, the interesting uh, it, part about digital autonomous corporations, of course, is that on the one hand, it's this programmatic thing, right? Where you've got these these high level rules and the ways that it operates. You know, the rules are essentially codified at a very high level. But then at a lower level, what, what Stan describes in his article is that Bitcoin and all cryptocurrencies are distributed autonomous corporations. You can buy them and hold them. And by holding some of the Bitcoins, you hold essentially a piece of the entire network. And if the entire network increases in value, then so does your piece. So in that way, it's like a share. And I think that the pricing behavior that we've seen from Bitcoin over time has actually been much closer to a share than it has been to a currency. It's so, an IPO. Yeah. Yeah. That idea, you know, the more that I think about it, it's hard at first. It's really it, it took me a second to, to understand it. And I'm still definitely trying to figure out all the implications of it. But it really does seem like that's a that's a better way to think about cryptocurrencies than as cryptocurrencies, because they're not just currencies. There are all these other things, too, that that aren't encompassed in that word. But digital autonomous corporations seems to do it. As a computer scientist, what I really love about looking at these environments is the fact that what you can see again and again is compelling evidence that certain patterns will lead to evolutionary processes regardless of where they appear, whether that's in science and stock markets and cryptocurrencies and in, in trading pork bellies, whatever it is. What you have really is the insight that simple rules or unintelligent agents following simple rules, when operating at scale and in large groupings, actually start exhibiting emergent intelligent behavior that is much, much greater than the sum of the parts. 
This is similar to what you see in ant colonies. You know, a lot of agents that are unintelligent individuals, but are extremely sophisticated as a colony. Bitcoin is very much like that. Each node on the network really is following some very, very simple rules. And out of that, you have this incredibly complex and sophisticated emergent behavior. And we're just getting started. And what's going to be really interesting is that if this plays out in full, a lot of people are predicting essentially that this leads to the kind of technological singularity. Essentially, if you have rapid evolution of agents that can control money, they will keep controlling money and evolving very rapidly. And that rate of evolution will accelerate in what is known as a technological singularity. Essentially, you have these agents becoming more and more sophisticated until they can no longer be understood by those examining them. Thanks for listening to episode 53 of Let's Talk Bitcoin. Content for today's show is provided by Stephanie Murphy, Andreas M. Antonopoulos, and Daniel Krawis. Music was provided by Jared Rubens and Nathaniel Castro. Any questions or comments? Email adam at letstalkbitcoin.com. See you next time.